step. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you today for this great celebration of life for Rosalind Carter. God, we pray for comfort today, especially for the family, the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren. We pray for all the staff that have done life with the Carters. We pray for the security teams that is here today. We pray for the Carter Center, God, that you will constantly Comfort them in time, God, as they grieve. But let them know one thing. We are celebrating her life today. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Miss Paige Alexander. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's really wonderful to be gathered with staff from the Carter Center and the Library and Museum uh, for this very special moment. Uh, We're grateful to the Carter family for letting us have this time and the opportunity to say farewell to our founder, especially for all of us who will continue to carry on her amazing work. From the time Jimmy Carter woke up and thought, I want to create a Camp David in the middle of Atlanta, Rosalind Carter was his full and equal partner. Everything that she did from the founding of the leadership, founding and the support and the leadership of the center, they did together. Her compassion, her ability to connect, her political savvy was something that helped build the support for all of our programs over the last 40 years. As in all parts of their life, they shared key decision-making and strategic vision for the center, and for that we're forever grateful. President and Mrs. Carter served in lockstep on health and peace missions throughout the world. Uh, He relied on her reporting skills and her amazing ability and intuition in assessing and negotiating with partners and world leaders. She was his right hand in difficult situations like Haiti and North Korea. She joined him while they sought peace in Liberia and the Middle East and Sudan, 
and she was there while helping nascent democracies in Latin America and Africa have free and fair elections. And of course, she worked and went to the end of the road to help with eradicating guinea worm and other neglected tropical diseases. She was moved by the people that she met, especially women and children and strong women leaders and families, people who wanted to have the same thing for her life that she felt she was giving to her family. And nothing speaks more uh, poignantly to that than her office here at the Carter Center. There is not one flat surface in that office that is not covered with a picture of her family, of her children, of her grandchildren, of her great-grandchildren, interspersed with world leaders, other first ladies, and uh, media influencers, because that's what she was. She was a people person. And one of my favorite pictures is the one that sits across from her desk, and it's a group of women outside the White House in 1979 protesting against the Equal Rights Amendment. And I asked why she kept it there, and she said, because there was a lot of work left to do when we left the White House. And for 40 years, she did that work. Her top priority was mental health, and with her staff and the amazing experts in the mental health task force, she advocated for changes in public policy and the availability of treatment for people who needed them and elimination of stigma. She, convinced, uh, she convened national and state leaders for the mental health task force, and she made sure we focused on at-risk children, veterans, and people who had been through trauma. She wrote two books, and then realizing that the media was covering in a very sensationalized way behavioral health issues, she decided that she was going to create a fellowship, and this fellowship was going to help educate media as to how to destigmatize and use the right language on mental health. From her time as honorary chair of the Carter Administration's Presidential Commission on Mental Health, she learned how crucial parity was and mental health insurance coverage. She knew that that was needed to overcome stigma. She worked for decades to get it passed into law, and one of the last calls she made uh, to Eve was to say, is there any way that we can get Georgia from a D ranking up into a B? So in 2022, when Georgia passed the Mental Health Parity Act, for her, that was a sign that people were that much closer to recovery. And it was also a sign that the mental health program and our team here would be carrying on her legacy. For the Carter Center's mission of waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope, Mrs. Carter was a force multiplier. President Carter described her as the perfect extension of myself. While intimately involved in the Carter Center programs for mental health, she also focused on advocacy for women, uh, insurance, vaccinations, environmental protections, human rights. It was all part of who she was as a colleague here at the center. She also shared her knowledge with students from Emory. She taught at uh, Emory for Women's Studies. She had an endowed chair in 1997 at Emory. It was the first mental health endowed chair at any university in the nation. She brought leaders like Madeleine Albright and Sandra Day O'Connor here to campus and to Emory, and she worked with Agnes Scott students, and uh, we are appreciative to have the Agnes Scott Choir here with us today. As the first CEO post, post their retirement, I got to spend time with them down in Plains, and it never failed that Mrs. Carter, as she always did, would walk you to the door, and that southern gracious hospitality to be sure that you were seen out, and she would share anecdotes with me about everything from sitting in cabinet meetings to rocking the boat when Margaret Thatcher, uh, when she sat in a cabinet meeting with Mar Margaret Thatcher, and she said, I think the staff just thought I was a woman, and that's why I was there, but I sat in all of Jimmy's meetings. So it was a true partnership. And all of this while she was packing up chocolate chip cookies for Barbara and Kashef and I to take back for the drive to make sure that they didn't go to waste. Former Carter Center CEO Dr. John Hardman spent two decades working closely with the Carters, and he will share a few of his memories to give us a sense of the energy that she brought and the excitement she brought when she was here at the center. This is our lore. This is our reminder of the spirit and the traditions that our founders, and it is our inspiration. 
And for now, it is my story, it is your story, and it will be everybody's story as we carry out her work here at the Carter Center. When asked what she wanted to be remembered for, she said, I would like to think that people understood that I took advantage of the opportunities that I was given, and I did the best that I could. And I have to say, Mrs. Carter did more than that, and we'll miss her terribly. Thank you, Paige. Mrs. Carter was selfless, caring, and kind. She was down to earth, genuinely interested in others, and tirelessly working to improve lives around the world. She and President Carter spent a work week at the center once a month. Days were packed from early morning to late at night and while each had their own schedule, they worked in partnership, aware of what the other was doing through conversations, emails that they shared, and briefing papers. They stayed in an apartment here at the center, sleeping in the study on a Murphy bed. A family dinner was scheduled each month. She considered the Carter Center staff like extended family, serving as a mentor, a colleague, and a strategist. Mrs. Carter took time to thank volunteers, to meet with interns, wanting to know details about all of their projects, their challenges, their successes, and invited every class of intern to Plains. She was inclusive and persuasive in pulling people together to work on issues. Her annual mental health symposiums resulted in groups of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and others collaborating to make progress on stigma and mental health issues. She was health conscious. While at the Carter Center and on trips abroad, Mrs. Carter made sure she watched what she ate, and particularly what President Carter ate <laughs> when she could, when she could. She arranged Tai Chi lessons for improving their balance. When President Carter lasted only a few sessions, feeling it was much too slow for him, she invited staff to join for the lessons. When realizing on a trip from Beijing to Hainan that two Chinese women in the group did not know Tai Chi, she stood in the aisle of the private plane and instructed them in what she practiced every day. She was detail-oriented and prepared. She described herself as a night person, unlike President Carter. She stayed up late before trips sewing buttons on his shirts and getting everything packed in a small suitcase. Before scheduled presentations, however, whether for a small group or a full auditorium, she would rise early, often before six, to review her remarks and make necessary and, and particularly made calls to check that all of her facts were correct. She was constantly learning about the countries and cultures of places she visited, seeking ways to ensure health and peace programs were making a difference. She related to villagers in Nepal or Mali as easily and warmly as her neighbors in Plains. Mrs. Carter was an advocate for women's rights and was well aware of the burdens of women she was thrilled when the Farmer of the Year in Ethiopia was a mother and her daughter. She would pick up babies and small children as if they were her own. If she observed a problem such as a cleft palate or a club foot, she wanted to know what, tr what treatment was available. She beamed when she heard mothers say their baby was named Jimmy 
I always felt that many should have been named for her. She was one of the best election monitors because she recorded every detail. She talked to polling officials and diligently completed each form. She sometimes led election monitoring efforts without President Carter. She was a keen observer of people and situations. Her detailed notes and meetings included comments on body language, the setting, and those in attendance to add to President Carter's summary. She was just as cost conscious as President Carter. And in budget meetings at the center, she asked questions to ensure program funds were being used wisely. While frugal and pragmatic, she was always stylish. During the Nobel Peace Prize events, she was elegantly dressed when standing on the balcony of her hotel, or her hotel room overlooking a crowd of people holding candles in the street below. Because of the freezing weather, she grabbed a blanket inside the hotel and draped it over her shoulders. Later, re reporters asked who designed her lovely shawl. <laughs> She was tough and competitive. When participating in Outward Bound with Carter Center staff, she coached President Carter on a helpful body position to use when scaling a rock wall. <laughs> she fearlessly walked across a narrow plank 20 feet in the air ahead of him. Mrs. Carter led by example. She rarely asked, anyone to do something that she wouldn't do herself. She treated everyone with respect and dignity. She was unpretentious, never seeking recognition for herself. Rosalind Carter will remain an inspiration for all of us.
Ms. Rosalind would say, it is truly well with my soul. She also would say to these young people, thank you so much for blessing her. And she would say, what such beautiful voices. She also would look around the room and say, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming and doing life with her. She would thank the honor guards for walking her in. She would thank all the fellows for being a part of the Carter Center. She would thank you, John, for doing life with her. She would thank you, Alexander, for taking it into the next level. Jason, she would love all over you and tell you thank you. And all the grandchildren, she would say thank you as well. We have an opportunity to continue the legacy. Alita, she would say, I love you, and I'm so glad you're here. Chip, she would say, thank you for all that you're doing, all that you're doing in Plains, all that you've done for the entire family. Jack, she would say, she just loves you to death. Jeff, she's so in love with you and Annette, she just don't know what to do. She loves all of you. Miss Alexander is right. When you go to Plains and Miss Rosalind would, would visit with her, she would walk you out the door. Even when she was frail, she would grab the walker and walk you out the door. Many a times I would say, Miss Rosalind, you don't have to get up, but she still would get up. I'll never forget when she made me eat a slaw dog. Some of y'all will catch that later. You probably had to eat a slaw dog too. <laughs> Jason, it was my first time. But I loved it. Today we get an opportunity to walk her home. Amy, she walked me out the door and we get an opportunity to walk her home. What a glorious day. So all the staff, on behalf of Ms. Rosalind Carter, Thank you, but keep it going. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for this vessel that you gave to us. Bless this family. Bless the staff. Bless all those that are grieving. But let them know she is dancing with you. She is not asleep. She is not dead. She is dancing with you. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.